On the right, Lloyd Smith. On the left, Philip Britt. And I'm your host, Barry Acock. We're in the arena. Welcome to episode two of In the Arena, where we're promoting civility in politics. But Philip, first tell us, how did we come up with the name In the Arena? Well, thanks, Barry. Uh, when Barry and I first started talking about doing a political show, we talked about what he just said, bringing some civility back to the discussion. And I immediately thought about a speech that Teddy Roosevelt gave in Paris after he was president. He was a former president. And he said, it's not the critic who counts. It's the man who's in the arena, uh, the person who's actually involved in it that really matters. And so that kept coming back to me. There's a whole lot of critics out there right now, uh, but we want to focus on the ones who are actually doing the work, who are actually trying, who are actually putting themselves out there. Uh, and, it, and it means something to me specifically. Um, I wear a pin on my lapel. You probably can't see it very well because it's not a close-up, but it's a it's a cowboy hat and three initials, JWS. It's in memory of a good friend of mine who passed away uh, several years ago. I met him at Boys State. I work at Boys State every summer uh, in the legislative school, teaching the legislative process to young men at Boys State. And this, this man had been through Boys State. By the time I got there, he'd been in the legislative school for several years. His name was Justin W. Stephen. And Justin, epitomized what it meant to be in the arena. He was the mayor of Appleton City, a small town in St. Clair County over in uh, western Missouri. And, but not only was he involved in, in his small town and, and helping his small town get ahead, but he, as a member of the Sons of the American Legion, a, a squadron that he started at Boy State, he lobbied in Jefferson City for veterans issues, even though he wasn't a veteran. Uh, but he had family members that had been and were, uh, and it was very important to him. He was involved every day. He died at a, at a young age. He was only 31 years old when he passed away. Uh, I miss him even today, but every time I sit here in, in this chair, I think about Justin. Now, after we decided on the name, Barry and I had a meeting with Lloyd, and Lloyd told us that that was very important, that, that speech was very important to him too. Lloyd, tell us about that. Well, uh, Bill Emerson was my uh, mentor, but also my boss from uh, 1981 to 1996. And Bill Emerson loved uh, Teddy Roosevelt. He'd read just about every book about Teddy Roosevelt. Maybe the only other person he read more books about were Jesus Christ and Abraham Lincoln. But uh, Bill loved the quote in the arena. In fact, uh, in 1996, uh, when we did uh, Bill's funeral in Cape Girardeau, I used that quote uh, in the eulogy that he had asked me to give. And I gave that eulogy and uh, it was heartfelt because Bill Emerson was in the arena. He moved back to this part of the world from Washington, D.C. after growing up in Jefferson County. And it's there where he is buried today in the little Hillsboro Cemetery that you can still go to, drive up a small drive right next to his grandfather who was his mentor, and on that tombstone is an etching of the capital of the United States. And on the other side of that tombstone is the quote from Theodore Roosevelt in 1910 in that wonderful speech, Citizenship in a Democracy, it's called In the Arena. And last week we started talking about presidential debates and the history of presidential debates. Philip and Lloyd covered some of their favorite presidential debates. This week we're gonna start off with some history of vice presidential debates. And Philip's going to start us off this evening. Absolutely. Uh, last week we talked a little bit about, obviously, presidential debates and how the first televised presidential debate was in 1960. There was not a vice presidential debate at that time. The first vice presidential debate happened in 1976. 
America was in a really strange situation at that time. The president, who had, was Richard Nixon, had just resigned, the first president to resign from office. Um, and Gerald Ford, who had not been elected as president, had been uh, elevated to that office uh, as a result of the constitutional amendment. Um, so he was running for re-election, though he'd never actually been elected. Debate happened between Bob Dole and Walter Mondale, who was the running mate of Jimmy Carter, who was the Democratic nominee for president. This was 1976 again. Um, the debate was interesting. It was a lot of back and forth. They were both sitting senators, uh, so they knew each other really well. Uh, I thought watching it again, I thought Bob Dole was, uh, was humorous at times, which kind of bled over into being a little snarky at times. Uh, he started off the debate with a great line. Uh, he said, you know, Senator Mondale and I are friends. We serve together. You know, when tonight's over, we'll still be friends. Uh, when the election's over and I'm vice president and he's still in the Senate, we'll still be friends. So he kind of started it off with, a, with a, a little bit of a zinger there, like we're going to win, and, uh, and even though they didn't, the problem for, for Bob Dole was he had, a, had to defend, essentially, the Republican Party uh, right after Watergate. A real challenge for anybody. Lloyd, which vice presidential debate will you be sharing with us this evening? 1984. 1984, we had Walter Mondale running for President of the United States against Ronald Reagan. His running mate that year was Geraldine Ferraro. This year, we have Joe Biden running for President of the United States. He's a former Vice President as well, and his running mate is Senator Harris from California. The uniqueness of this means that our candidate for Vice President, Mike Pence, will have to defend the record of Donald Trump just as George Herbert Walker Bush had to defend the record of Ronald Reagan. And if you think about the two running mates that each of them chose, in 1984, Mondale picked Congresswoman Geraldine Ferraro, which had been the first vice presidential candidate female on either ticket. And that's fairly unique. But then this year, we find that we have a candidate from California, Senator Harris, who has been picked by Joe Biden to represent him as vice presidential candidate. And so the debate this evening will be from a sitting vice president running to re get reelected, defending a record, being probably attacked just a little bit by Senator Harris from California, who is on the liberal side of the equation, just as Geraldine Ferraro was on the liberal side of the equation. Philip, what was your general view of last week's vice presidential debate? Well, my, my first impression was that um, Vice President Pence seemed very poised, um, very confident. I mean, he, he's obviously a, a practiced debater, one who's been uh, in that role many times, someone who's, who um, understood where he was as far as uh, what he wanted to share, um, you know, Yes, he did a couple of times uh, try to insert himself into uh, Senator Harris's answers, um, but that was just in response to those answers, and, and it wasn't anything like what we saw last week where the, the presidential candidates were, were back and forth throughout the, the entire time. Now, he did have a tendency to speak over time, uh, but as a debater, uh, if you get the opportunity, if, as a candidate, if you get the opportunity to continue to talk and they don't shut your microphone off, you're going to continue to talk. Um, and so he did that. He had things he wanted to say and he wanted to get that out there. I think he, uh, he had kind of a script that he wanted to follow. He had certain issues and certain talking points that he wanted to, to nail down and wanted to consistently get throughout the, the debate. Um, and I think he was able to do that to a certain degree. Now, the thing I liked about last night's or last week's debate, as opposed to uh, the one the week before with the presidential candidates, was the fact that there was some discussion of issues. Uh, and I know we're going to get into those a little bit more uh, as we discuss. But but I thought that that I did think that uh, Vice President Pence needed to kind of hit a home run to kind of bring them back uh, to where they were even before uh, the presidential debate. Uh, I don't think he hit a home run, 
uh, but I don't think he grounded out either. So to use a baseball analogy, so You're straddling the fence, Philip. I'm I'm not, but I but I absolutely don't think he hit a home run. So he didn't bring them all the way back, but maybe maybe he stopped the bleeding to use a different analogy. So so Lloyd, what was your general observations of last week's vice presidential debate? Specifically, he covered Vice President Mike Pence. What were your impressions of Senator Kamala Harris? Well, it was it was evident from the start that. Uh, Senator Harris had a message to give, and she was going to do everything she could to stay on that message. Uh, it was probably a little bit more uh, drama with, with Senator Harris. She wanted to make sure that she presented herself as a strong force up on that stage. I think probably one of the things that conflicted her a little bit, when maybe thrown her off, was when uh, the vice president talked about her positions early on in the primary season and how those at times conflicted with the person she wants to serve as vice president to if elected. I think ultimately uh, the goal was her not to do any harm. Uh, if the polls are correct, and, and, and we've all talked about this among ourselves and the country talks about this, what, what are polls showing? I don't know. Uh, I don't answer polls anymore when they come in on my phone ID and a lot of people don't. But I think her goal was to not do any harm but also present herself as strong enough to be the Vice President of the United States of America, the strongest country on the face of the earth. Did she achieve that in total? I think with her presentations at times she did. With the, with the conflict that she had early on with her positions and the ones she was working for, uh, or wanting to work for as vice president, that put her a, somewhat in a quandary. But going back to the 1984 situation, uh, you know, that was a, a problem for George Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, George Herbert Walker Bush was defending uh, his president, Ronald Reagan, who he served with, and he had talked about voodoo mm -hmm. economics in 1980. Yep. And Geraldine Ferraro went right at that because it was somewhat of a conflict. They also had somewhat of a conflict as it pertained to life and uh, the whole abortion question. And Geraldine Ferraro was not hesitant to about attacking that. And I think what we saw uh, this week is that Senator Harris wanted to point out any differences that she could find between uh, the vice president and the president. And also she had to defend the differences she had between who she wants to serve as vice president if elected and uh, the positions that he and she differed on early on in the campaign. All great points. My general observation of the debate last week was, I feel like it was a tie, it's according to which channel you watch, whether Kamala Harris won or Mike Pence won. So yes, overall, I thought it was a tie. I don't think it moved the needle for anybody. If anything, it stopped the bleeding for the Trump campaign. They were kind of in dire straits over the last two weeks since the first debate. They've kind of been on a downhill tumble since then. And I do think Vice President Mike Pence done a great job of stopping the bleeding. But Lloyd, you bring up a good point. And Philip, I'm gonna ask you and you also, Lloyd, does the vice presidential candidate and the presidential candidate, how close politically do they need to be? Or maybe they don't need to be close at all. What's your impression of that? Well, we, we see that a lot when there's a, a, a heated contested primary and then one of the, uh, the, con the contestants who are content contending for the primary uh, for president uh, then get named as the vice presidential candidate. Um, I a prime example is, is George Bush and, and Ronald Reagan. Um, it was it was obvious at that time that the two of them did not get along um, and they were at odds with each other. I mean, I, I can only imagine what it would have been like if, if President Trump had chosen any of those people who were his competitors in the, in the primary because it was an incredibly contentious primary and, and he was real critical of all of them. Uh, and so it's interesting always to see that. Um, and, and, you know, the people understand that they don't, that the president and the vice president don't have to always agree, but there's always that potential that that vice president becomes the president, you know, and, and that's a question that, that neither one of them was willing to answer last night, you know, 
one of those two individuals will be the vice president for the oldest president to ever be uh, inaugurated as president of the United States. And uh, they didn't answer the question about, have you all talked about whether or not you're going to be, uh, what will happen and how you'll carry on. That's usually a question that's asked in a debate. Um, you know, if something were tragically to happen to the president, uh, how would you carry on? Would it be your own philosophy or would you follow his or her lead? Uh, always been his lead. Um, but so, so that's a question that, that the people need to look at. Does, is it important to me that uh, if I'm electing Joe Biden as president or if I'm electing Donald Trump as president, is it so important to me that if he's out of the way, that whoever takes his place follows exactly the, the plan that he's laid out. Um, I wouldn't expect that Mike Pence's plan would be exactly the same as Donald Trump's plan. Um, they have totally different backgrounds and totally different life experiences, so I think they probably would have some different ideas about things. Same with Senator Harris and, and Vice President Biden. Uh, so from, from my standpoint, they're each an individual person. Um, but right now, since she's the vice presidential candidate, she has to support his presidency. And so that's a real shift from being a candidate uh, competing against someone to being a candidate supporting someone, a huge shift. Lloyd, how politically close do the vice presidential candidate and the presidential candidate need to be? I think uh, maybe if you look back, I mean, you know, Kennedy and Johnson weren't very close. Uh, Reagan and Bush weren't very close. Uh, this year, obviously, uh, our vice president never ran against the incumbent president, uh, unlike uh, Biden and Harris. I think they probably are very close on their goals, and how to achieve them is what's different. And it may be stylistic, or it could be fundamental. And if it's fundamental, that's something the American people ought to know. Uh, if it's stylistic and they're still headed in the same direction, that's, that's totally different. But I think uh, in my lifetime, this is the most crucial uh, vice presidential choice that we have seen. Uh, you cannot have someone that's going to be 78 if they win and inaugurated, and someone that's 74, soon to be 75, if he wins a second term. Uh, you've got to look at their health. You've got to look at longevity. And you've got to look at what is their plan for the future. And I think uh, you want that vice president to know what that plan is. Uh, you don't want to be like Harry Truman and uh, not know about the nuclear weapon until after uh, his boss dies in office. So I would expect there should be a very close connection. And I think there is between uh, our vice president and the president. And I would expect there would have to be between Biden, if he would win, and his vice president, anything less than that would be a disservice to democracy, in my opinion. Well, that's the reason they say they're a heartbeat away, right? That's, a, that's exactly the reason. So let's get into some of the issues of the debate last week. I'll, I'll start off with Vice President Mike Pence. The very first question was the one I felt like that made him the most uncomfortable. He's the head of the Coronavirus Task Force, and to Democrats, he's the face of failure. To Republicans, they think he's doing a good job. So I felt like he was really deflecting and just really uncomfortable right at the beginning. But let's just start talking about the very first question. We'll try to get into a few more issues. But Philip, you go first. Sure. I've gotten to go first every time tonight, so that's good. Um, I think that, you know, he, he made, I think, the comment something to the effect of it was the the largest mobilization uh, in since World War II of individuals, of first responders, of just the, the government mobilizing to assist people. Um, and, you know, I think that's probably a good point. Um, I think the fact that uh, many of us feel like it should have gone farther, um, and, and we've talked in, 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 in our own discussions about whether there should have been a federal mandate of some kind to, you know, whether it's masks or whether it's, you know, staying at home for two weeks or whatever, whatever it could have been. Um, I, I do think they, that it's possible that they missed some things that could have happened earlier in the process. Uh, and 
I think their, their, uh, their strategy and their attempt to, uh, to get first responders the, the equipment they needed and hospitals the, the equipment they needed, um, I don't think they were prepared for it before it happened, obviously, for whatever reason. Uh, Vice President Pence blames the, blames the Obama administration for basically leaving the stockpile empty, um, whereas President, or Vice President Biden will say no, it wasn't. It was in the right. Everything was where it should have been, but uh, they emptied it out. So I, who knows? I, I don't know that we're ever going to get the the real answer on where all that happened. Um, that the there should have been a, a plan in place for a pandemic since we'd already been through it before. There should have been a plan plan in place, and they should have followed that plan from the very beginning. Uh, it seemed like it took them a while to get started with that. Um, he defended the president in, in closing down <clears throat> people coming back from China or coming in from China and doing that early on in the process, um, which, which is, is where he needs to be as far as defending the president, defending what, what uh, they did as part of the task force. Um, but I think Senator Harris continued to kind of hammer on the fact that uh, you all just didn't listen to uh, the, the science. Uh, early enough and I don't know what you know we don't know what information the president was getting uh, she's basically using the words of of the president to, to Bob Woodward in the book that he wrote um, but I, I don't know what he knew early on none of us do and so I think it's important for us to, to, to look at uh, and I think Vice President Pence made a really good point in that he pointed out that the things that the Biden-Harris campaign are suggesting at this point should be done are things that they've been doing, just more of it. And so I think that it's important for them to kind of, for us to at least recognize that uh, they've made an effort, there, ha there has been some politicization of all of it, um, and that's come from both sides, I think, but I think it's, now it's important for us to move forward, and I think that's where kind of, they, they both want to be, but I don't know that they ever got there last night. Philip, those are all great points, but Lloyd, I'm not going to ask you that question. I'm going to just throw you a trick question, okay? Okay. When you're, when you're in office or you're in the arena, it's easily to get the blame for what's going wrong, right? So do you think the president, vice president, share the responsibility of the blame, or do you think they're just the warm body in office, therefore they're going to get the blame? I think a little of both. I mean, if you're, if you're in control of, of the government and something goes wrong, uh, then, you know, initially the blame is going to go straight to who's at the top. Uh, you know, I remember on 9-11, there were people that said that we should have been more prepared uh, eight months into the Bush administration, and we should have been ready for all the things that happened. And I think we were ready for a lot of things, but we probably weren't ready for, for someone taking box cutters and, and holding people hostages on, air, on airplanes. I think in this case, what you saw with COVID-19 is that we were prepared for a type of pandemic that we had never experienced before. And we had scientists that gave you conflicting information about what could happen and what couldn't happen. And I think probably what happened in the debate was that we were looking at, and, and the vice president was trying to explain, that we didn't get really good information out of China very early. And by the time we got that information, that Chinese New Year had already happened, six million people had been in and out of China, and then they were all over the world, and then they admitted, you know, this could be transferred from person to person and not from animal to person. And suddenly, the pandemic that we thought was going to remain in a, in a province in China was all over the world, and scientists came together and said, how bad is it? How bad can it get? How is it transmitted? And even today, we're learning that the first four days that you're infected and you do not have symptoms are very likely your most contagious time. Imagine we're eight, nine months into a pandemic and just now the scientists are embracing that as part of the problem. And so do you wear a mask when you have no symptoms whatsoever? Well, back in March, they didn't think you needed to, but then it became more and more evident that maybe that ought to happen. And by that time, you're looking at not having enough masks. I know on the farm, 
Uh, we still use N95 masks in some of our locations, and that was one mask that actually helps you both ways, breathing in or breathing out, and those were in extreme short supply because no one really thought you would have to have that kind of mask uh, nationwide instantly. So I think COVID has taught us a big lesson. I think if you're the incumbent, you have to look at yourself and what you've done and what you haven't done. And I think we've all learned a lot from COVID-19, not the least of which is that we have to look at our first responders and those who are likely to have a, a, a terrible outcome. And who are they? Where are they? And I, I think one time I said an after action report here will reflect on what we could do and what we should do and how we prepare for the future. But yes, if you're at the top of the decision chain, you get blamed for almost everything. And I can remember several times working for the Emersons when we got blamed for everything from floods to uh, bankruptcies to grain elevators, all of those things. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good point though, Lloyd. So when you're in the middle of a big crisis like this, you almost have to be reactive, right? You can't be proactive because it's already here. So everybody's just trying to play catch up at that point in time. So that's a great point. But like you said, if you're at the top, that's who's going to get the credit or the blame. Usually not the credit though, it's usually the blame. So let's talk about one more issue before we end the show. This is a, an issue that's near and dear to my heart that came up at the vice presidential debate last night. Is China. I think both sides are to blame for our trade differences, trade imbalances with China. I think that Democrats, Republicans alike, have just sold out to China over the years. But I also think President Trump's trade war they started with China has been terrible for our farmers in the area. We've had 20, 20 year historical low soybean, corn, cotton prices. So the trade war to me has not worked. But I'm not totally blaming President Trump for the trade war with China. He tried to do something about it. I just think he had the wrong tactic, used the wrong leverage. It hasn't worked. I wish he would declare victory for our farmers and just move on, even though we've lost so far. But there's many different parts of the China trade war. But the farmers taking the brunt of all of it right now. And I can't, I've talked to many farmers and they're not for tariffs. These tariffs have killed are global markets. Farmers are in a global market now. China was their number one customer on soybeans. They're not really buying a lot of soybeans right now. So we can sit here and debate whose fault it is or not. It's everybody's fault. But Philip, the China and the overall trade war that we're in now, but really it's a historical pathway backwards to everybody's to blame all the way back to Dwight Eisenhower. We have to recognize, and I know, I know that we we focus on um, the United States and doing what we can to support our own um, manufacturing, our own uh, farmers, but what you mentioned really struck a chord with me, and that is that it, it is a global situation. It's not, we, we can't isolate ourselves like we tried to do before World War II. We, we can't say, you know, we're, gonna, we're just gonna do, deal with ourselves, we're not gonna deal outside of, of our own country, we can't do that. I mean, it, the, the world has changed. Um, we don't, we can't be independent from the entire world. And, and I think that's something that we have to recognize. It'd be nice if we could, it'd be nice if we could be self-sufficient, uh, but I don't think that's realistic. And I think that's, that's one of the things that, um, I think President Trump would like to see that. I think he, you know, he's, he's worked toward um, independence from, from OPEC and others producing oil, so he's made, tried to make us energy independent, uh, and has done a pretty good job with that. Uh, whether you agree with how he's gone about it or not, that's, you know, that's uh, another issue. But I think it's important for us to recognize that we just can't isolate ourselves. Farmers don't have a market just in the United States to sell all the products that we, that we, manufacture, that we grow or the manufacturers manufacture. So we have to make sure that we uh, we continue to have allies around the world too. I mean, we don't want to, to alienate our allies. Uh, we don't want to, to make things so difficult on them that they don't want to work with us or buy from us. And so um, it's not just China, it's other countries around the world as well. But obviously uh, the, the trade war with China has been uh, a real, I think is a real sticking point for a lot of folks when it comes to supporting President Trump for reelection. Well, I don't know about that because farmers seem to be sticking with him, so maybe it's not a sticking point, but 
Lloyd, I think Democrats and Republicans can both agree that China has mistreated us. I think we all agree on that. I just feel like that we're not doing anything about it. I think there may be a lot of lip service going on with this trade war we got right now because we don't seem to be getting a lot of results. And as a Republican, I'm sure you're gonna say, well, it's still coming, and maybe it is. That could be a fair statement, but so far the farmers have took a big big loss and a big brunt of this trade war, so. I, I think, uh, well, the farmers did. You know, I own a farm myself. Uh, and if you'll recall, the Trump administration made a serious effort to send money to farmers directly but to offset what China was doing when they shut down purchases of some of our product. The problem in dealing with China is they want to be the number one world power. They want to control almost everything that we use in ways that's strategically dangerous for us. So as we got into the pandemic, we noticed they had the ability to hold back some ingredients that would have helped us in the treatment, not necessarily the cure, but the treatment of COVID-19. What we've also found is that they have stolen a lot of intellectual property that has put us at a disadvantage. They basically stole most of the propulsion system for our submarines from us, and they are doing things like that all across the board. I think we have to understand that China is 1.5 billion people. Ultimately, they want food in the bellies of those people. They will buy our product they are now seeing they have to buy our product. And we've seen an uptick because they're back in the marketplace. And if they don't buy it from Phil, they'll buy it from you or they'll buy it from me, but they will buy it. And that will help the overall market. You know, Philip Lloyd, we were doing a lot of talking before we come on camera about, I didn't feel like the vice presidential candidates actually answered this specific question. You've prepped a lot of debate participants. Has there ever been a time when the participant looks at you and says, I really don't want to answer that question. Oh, absolutely. There are times when you, when you have a candidate and what you try to teach them to do is to capture maybe a word or two in the question and pivot to something they really want to talk about. Uh, I don't want to say that I did this, but maybe I did. Uh, we had a candidate one time who was really concerned about what am I going to say, what am I going to say, and I said, well, here's five answers. And the candidate looked at me and said, well, Lloyd said, what if the question doesn't pertain to one of those answers? I said, it really doesn't matter. Give one of these five <laughs> answers. So thank you for joining us here on In the Arena. We hope you'll join us again next week.